Um, so, a consultant interview for those who have stayed and are interested. Um, again, just from what I've already talked about, this is a very, very different challenge again. For me, it was actually a little, it was more difficult than the exam. And the reason I say that is because for the exam, you're more or less doing revision of stuff that you're already familiar with for the reasons that you've done an upper GI job, you've done your MRCS and all of that. But for a consultant interview, this is all very much new information. I'll come on to what I mean by that. As, uh, who was it? It's a whole new world. Peter Andre and uh, Kate Price who uh, sang a whole new world, I don't know. Um, Liar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it is. Um, as a reg, you sort of turn up to work, you think, I've done an aneurysm, that's great, I hope the patient survives, and do they su survive? And that's pretty much your only concern, can I do the operating? And you sort of discover, like I say, this whole new world of, when you're a consultant, this sort of aneurysm operation then takes on these other facets and factors like length of stay, are you meeting national audit things, finances, commissioning, and the list goes on. So whereas for us at the moment, it's sort of an operation and survival and getting the patient out of the hospital, there's then this whole new other level of stuff you sort of need to know about. Now, knowing about this isn't essential. And again, it's like the evidence. I worked it into my responses rather than they asked me specifically about it. But given that it's getting more competitive in certain fields, if you do know about it, it will make you stand out more. And it is high stakes. I worked harder for this than I did for my exam, to be fair. I treated it like an exam, and I worked harder for my uh, consultant interview. And again, just sort of proviso my experience, my approach. The jobs come out in the BMJ careers and on NHS jobs, and actually to apply, you've got to go through uh, NHS jobs. And although I was told a job's a job in the current climate, which very much... It is. Um, if there is more than one available, how do you decide if you want to apply for both or one or not apply for one and, and wait for another one to come out? I suppose what type of work do you want to do? Do you want to do really complex, level four, regional centre referral stuff? If you're a sort of cancer benign split speciality, do you want to do that? Do you want to have an academic pursuit? One of the colorectal surgeons in Hull who's just got a job said to us, well, say just a, few, a couple of years ago now probably, he said the most important thing about your job is not you, it's your partner and your colleagues. Because you as a person can work anywhere, but number one, when you come home, is your wife or husband going to be happy? Or are they fed up because of where they're living and the environment, you know, that there's no, I don't know, Harvey Nichols around the corner? Um, and also, how are you going to interact with your colleagues? Are these the people that essentially for 30 years you're going to be seeing every day, day in, day out? Are they going to help you out when you need help? Or are they going to say, I'm really sorry, I've had a drink, as you hear the can open down the phone. Um, so, and the other thing is how the place is run. What's the theatres like? Are you sat there for an hour waiting for the next patient? Um, How's the unit? And what's the overall feel of the place like? Is it a friendly environment to be working in? So once you've decided you want to apply, there's a standardised online application for all the posts on the NHS Jobs website. So you've got to register with that to apply for a job. And certain information it saves to all applications. So it is good in that way, but as an application process, it is very, very time-consuming longer than you would think. You do not have a CV. You do not submit a CV. There are seven areas of free text statement, which is harking back to see people shuddering having gone through the whole MTAS process. Um, and you've got to make sure you stand out. And I'll go through what those areas are. But I got my statements, each section reviewed by a couple of consultants, a couple of my mates, some of you were in the room, um, for structure, spelling, content and because there's a limited word count you've got to make sure that every single word you use counts and there's no sort of flannel wastage or anything in there 
and I'll come on to that because there's sections that are only 150 words and you've got to make sure that you stand out somehow. Usual stuff, personal information, equality and diversity, what qualifications have you got, what courses have you been on? And talk about time consuming, I was having to go back to dig out certificates from 2001 to see how many days long, how many days I spent doing my basic surgical skills course. Because they ask you how long the course was, like two and a half days long. So on the form, but that's because I've not done a lot of courses, so <laughs> I had to put it down. So um, yeah, you know, it is time consuming. Again, you've got to put all your jobs down out of your employment history, going right the way back to your house officer jobs, your end and start date addresses, which you've got to go and find for your house officer jobs. And then you've got to put in your description of your roles and your current roles and duties. And this is the largest free text session within the section within the application. What you do is you get you've got to tailor your response. So get the job description. Um, and get the person specification and make sure that you essentially know what they want and tick all that off as you go through it. MTAS, you know, what are the buzzwords? Your communication skills, your organisational skills, team working. This is an example of how I dealt, uh, demonstrated flexibility and all that stuff. Um, and this is something, and the bottom one is something that I nicked off uh, the girl that I revised for my section T with, because we then ended up applying for jobs at the same time, which I thought was genius. I support my secretarial staff and make sure that I, all my clinic letters, admin and patient documentation is done in an accurate and timely fashion. This massive thing about patient safety, information governance and all of that, and I thought that was genius, so that went on my application as well. <laughs> So, there's a 150 word section about clinical audit and your experiences. 150 word section about your teaching experience. And what I've put on there, tell them you teach at different grades. Tell them that you've done undergraduate, postgraduate, CRISP, ATLS, MRCS courses, whatever you've done. So you demonstrate that you can teach any level. Levels being that you can teach, uh, you've taught on courses that are local courses, you've taught on national courses like ATLS or whatever, Chris, and you've taught in different formats, as in, I've created an online module. E-learning's a big thing, so I, I've created an e, I can, I've taught through the medium of the internet, I've taught in lectures, I've taught in small group scenarios. Talk about your most relevant research work and publications. You've got to demonstrate 500 words. Demonstrate versatility. I've sort of, so as a vascular surgeon, I've not just published about vascular stuff. You know, I've taken colorectal stuff. I've, t I've published on X, Y, and Z. So it demonstrates that I'm, I'm not narrow, I'm not, I'm not blinking. I've got a bit of versatility. Motivation from practice. I was fed up about getting referrals of leg pain that were everything else. So in one of those moments when you've got a real grump on, I wrote this uh, editorial about ABPIs and how all primary care people and referring specialities should be doing ABPIs. And it got published as an a, a, a editorial. And you talk about how you've taken motivation from your practice to actually do stuff. So it shows you motivated. And then at this stage, what you should be doing now is also showing that you're supporting juniors through their um, research and through their getting out case reports and stuff like that. Examples of your approach to working in a team, 150 words. We've all worked, whatever special, speciality you do as an MDT, so everyone's got a starter at least. Um, your clinical skills and competency relevant to the post. Only 150 words, but again, you've got to be confident, but don't be overconfident. And you've got, I mean, I put in a section that, although I, you know, my skill set is X, Y and Z, I am aware that, that I, there will be situations where I may need to call for help or ask for senior support. And then finally, you've got a supporting information section of 500 words, where there's no section about your management experience, and that is even little things like, I've helped with a rotor or design a rotor. Anything, you know, put it in. Um, if you've worked on the units where you're applying for a job for, put that in. It has to be anonymous. 
uh, if you've got a working relationship with people already there, say that. And if there's personal motivation for applying for some of those jobs, put that in. Uh, there's no reason not to, as long as it's anonymous. And then you've got to get five referees. So, and again, they've got to be within a certain time of working with them. And again, it's in terms of time consuming, you've got to go and get their fax numbers and things like that, their addresses and their email addresses and put all that in. Did you put a referee down from the place that you were applying for? Uh, I, I applied for Huddersfield, which was the first interview, and then Bradford, and I think there would have been a, a referee from Bradford in my list. But, you know, if you've worked in a number of, you know, jobs within this region, and the jobs in the region, I don't see why not. You know, you've got to, really. I mean, one of my referees would have been a clinical director at the time of one of the units I was applying for, but, yeah. I mean, people did, yeah. And the reason I've got all this list up is also that if you see that there's any deficiencies there, and you've got a year, two years, whatever, you can start building towards filling out these sections in your application. Quick run through the timeline of these things, because again, you don't have a lot of time. The advert for me came out at the end of May, I had to have the application in by mid-June, shortlisted early July. I organised and prepared like the exam, I'll show you my geeky timetable, make sure your seat's clean. My favourite slash lucky seat. I'd worn to a christening, and I didn't realise that when I got it out of the cupboard, there was this streak of trifle all the way down the back of it. There you go. Little things. Last minute panic. Uh, you had about a week or so to get your essay in. Uh, Pre-interview visit, which I'll talk about, very strange thing. But you've got to do them, and you've only got about two to three week period in which you're going to have to visit these very busy people who are clinical directors, medical directors, chief executives... You've got your own clinical... What's that, Kirsty? What's the essay? I'll tell you about that. We had to write, you had to write an essay as well. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the essay and stuff. So we had to write an essay as part of our process. Um, and you've got to fit in these things. And then the interview is the start of August. So not a lot of time. So this is my second geeky timetable, which was actually, because I was so stressed, was broken, broken down into morning, afternoon <laughs> and evening. I got a shortlisted notification at the beginning of July. The interview's at the end of August, and in the middle of it, I had a week of acute, which I have to thank Sonia for covering one of them, so I could actually go and speak to the people in Huddersfield um, about the job. So what do you look at? Uh, what are the resources for this? You know, you've got your textbooks for your exams. Before your in pre-interview visits, which I'll talk about, you read the Trust Annual Report and look at the Trust website, and the Trust Annual Report is on the Trust website. They will have their vision, their mission, their core values. And I try to work those in to talking about them in my pre-interview visit and my presentation, which again we'll talk about how to do a presentation in the interview, uh, to make them realise that I'd learnt about the institution, I was paying interest to where I was going to work. Now about the structure of the trust, what the divisions and directorates, any new developments that you think might be relevant to you, I read about these, these newsletters that you generally look at in the theatre coffee room when you've got nothing better to do, and you read through these newsletters and laugh at all the pictures of all these people holding up their gold pen or whatever. And on the front page of the most recent one, it said about they don't just opened a brand new renal unit in Huddersfield. And so in my interview, one, in fact, in my presentation, one of the sections of my presentations was, could we therefore start delivering vascular access service in, in Huddersfield? So... These things you pick out of the most random places but could turn out to be very important in your application or your interview process. Have they got any awards or commendations? You're going to get asked the question, why do you want to come and work here? Huddersfield got awarded Acute Healthcare Trust of the Year, things like that. They got a commendation on stroke care, which again links in with the vascular service. So it's all stuff that you can need to know about and you can then bring into your interview. And again, stuff that you wouldn't ordinarily know about for your red rotation. What do they look at in terms of quality improvement strategy? And this is really important to the management level. It's a massive list. And <clears throat> just this is the stuff that I said was non-essential. But if you know about it, it'll stand out. Care bundles was a big thing recently. And the aneurysms are bringing out the quality improvement programme. Obviously, the new health and social care bill, clinical governance, and the medical director, or the divisional director I went to see is, I don't, and this was the pre-interview, I don't want to know about 
the seven pillars. If you get asked a question about it, I want to know about your personal interpretation of what it means to you. Revalidation, and then this stuff that you, it was just like there's a new language to me. From, sequin, crest, stuff like that. Outcome measures, cash saving, things like that. Training, and then stuff, new stuff that's specific to your speciality. For me, screening program. Targets on getting diabetic feet seen within 24 hours, getting your carotids done within two weeks or 24 hours, depending on where. Reconfiguration. And again, where do you get this resource? Department of Health website, NICE website, your association, so the VSGBI. And actually, a load of them, I just ended up doing Google searches and seeing presentations from various regions and this and that. And like I say, it's not essential, and I don't mean this to stress you out, but if you want to stand out from the crowd in an interview of six, seven people, you're going to need to sort of pull some stops out. So the pre-interview visits, these are expected and advised. And so what that means is when you get shortlisted, or what we happen to us, is you've got a list of who's going to be on your interview panel. And next to the people that you were meant to go and see were their phone numbers or their secretary's phone numbers. And so you rang them up. And, and I, I've never been one for going to see people. I find it very awkward. Um, but I was told that actually it's expected of you and some people are frowned on if they don't actually go and visit these people beforehand. So I phoned them all up, made appointments. So the meetings lasted from anything between from 15 minutes, which was, hi, who are you? Here's my CV. Thank you very much. Good luck with the interview. And that's all it was. Up to an hour when you sat there having a cup of tea with some director who ends up, you went to school with their daughter or something or the other, and or they went to the same school as them and had a chat about that. And like I say, initially for me it's very awkward, because what do you do? You know, do you come in and go, I want this job, let's talk about it. Um, <laughs> you know, or do you say, oh, hi, I'm Niraj, and they go, what are you here for, for uh, the job? Um, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's just one of those moments where you feel awkward, but they don't. They've done this loads of times before. They're expecting you to come, they know why you're coming. And actually, it was, like I say, it was relatively informal. It was very much a get-to-know-you thing. Um, where you, it was personal questions. None of them asked me how many aneurysms I could do, or this or that. Where do you live? Have you got any kids? You know, things like that, really. Um, who have you worked with before? Do you know anyone here? Uh, but, given that, you do have, and especially if you're as you say, going to interview or applying in somewhere you've worked before or in a unit you've worked before, you can sort of slip into this thing where you're just chatting to one of your mates who you've either worked with as a reg or someone who you've worked for before, but you've, I suppose it's one of those things where you've got to maintain your professionalism. Um, <clears throat> it's an opportunity for you to ask questions. What's expected of me? I, you know, do you think you might want to start a specialist clinic, a one-stop clinic for X, Y, and Z? Can I start delivering this specialist service if you don't do it now? And get a feel for the place. It's an opportunity for them. Like I said, it's surprisingly personal. They'll ask you, are you interested in research? Would you be happy going out and liaising with PCTs about commissioning and stuff like that? And actually, because it's relatively informal, they may well give you some decent advice and drop some significant hints as well. So um, what I did is I walked straight out of the office, sat somewhere down the corridor and just wrote down everything that they'd said, even before I phoned anyone, even before I got in my car, before I did anything, just so it was all there. So what's the process? Well, after all of that, I had to submit an essay, um, which I'll come on to. I understand York are doing personality and attitude testing and actually take people out after that as well. I don't know anything about that, um, but again, I think for the breast job that was recently advertised here and for the vascular job, people went through some process which involved personality and attitude testing. I can't tell you about that. I had to do a 10-minute presentation, a one-hour interview, and this other new thing is a user panel interview, which I didn't have, but the person I worked with uh, and got the breast job did have, and these are patients who have used the service recently that they invite back to interview you with no medical other medical personnel there. 
So you sit with them and they ask you questions about how you deliver service, how you'd improve it, and I suppose essentially what they want to see is that you can communicate, you're empathic and you're responsive to their needs. And one of the guys that I went to see on the pre-interview visit who was a relatively old school surgeon who you might assume would have been a bit sort of negative about that sort of thing said, well, on paper you might have the best CV. You might come across to us really well, but who's going to be you're dealing with and who you're going to be seeing in outpatients is your patients. If you can't talk to them, what's the point in us employing you? Which is a fair point. So the statement I had to write was a 500 word statement and that was a title, which is quite long. Why do you want this job? What experience, skills and personal qualities will you bring which will make you an excellent colleague and a first class clinician? I could write none. So I had to something. So, again... Okay, I did start 20 minutes late, but I'll run through it. What time is it now? It's intense. So we have to be out of here at five. I mean, Mr. Miller did know that when he put the venue. I know. Okay, I'll five minutes. <laughs> it's ten two. I'll be doing seven and a half minutes. If that's Are you right. clarify it? <laughs> Everyone will do it. They're they're really good. Um, so. Put in personal reasons, there's no reason not to, and actually it's important, if you've got family in the area, it's, it shows that you're committed to that area, you're not going to get a job there and then move to a consultant job elsewhere. Put in stuff that we discussed in the trust report, and I'm sorry, I'll just rush through the last bit. Um, again, it's that whole buzzword section there, your skills and quality, I deliver high quality elective emergency care, I'm aware I need assistance, I'm friendly, approachable and all of that. Um, and again, get it reviewed by one person, two people, three people. Your presentation is going to be ten minutes on something topical, either nationally or locally. That was the uh, title of mine. How will the vascular surgical team address the challenges of the next five years? Get advice. Ask as many people as you can. Ask as people from as many different roles as you can. Ask your consultants, ask your nurses, ask patients, ask everyone. It's no harm. And ask people from outside of your area. For my presentation, some of the most novel and interesting information I got was from one of the girls who my wife used to work with on the HDE, who's now a vascular specialist nurse in Bristol. And she gave me some stuff that they're doing which isn't really done here. So you can get information from strange places which is really useful. Sorry, Dinesh, go on. To get the topic on the day of the two. No, 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 no. That came through with the shortlisting information. So you had about a month as well for that. But whilst you've got to go and be seeing people doing your essay, which has to be in about a week or two before, you know, this was left quite late. Make it very centre and job specific. If you've worked in a unit, obviously there'll be advantages. Don't do a generic one as, oh, I can see across the country there's this. In this region, in this hospital, these are the changes. Um, Stick to your timing, don't stand up with notes. Um, there are stories of you being told it's a 10 minute presentation, someone went on for 10 and a half minutes, the projector was just turned off. Game over. No, I'll just rush through it like we've just done then. The projector went off, that was it. You're not prepared, it's a reflection on your ability, your preparation, your professionalism. Stick to time, don't use notes. It doesn't happen everywhere. Um, and just have energy and enthusiasm. Um, review your own CV and statement subjectively and get someone else to do it. What are the gaps? Things like, why did I choose my referees? I've got a lack of endovascular experience. Why have I got loads of case reports compared to full paper publications? Just things that are on your CV that you take for granted, you might get asked about. <coughs> I wrote, I wanted to join a dynamic trust. They could turn around and go, well, what's dynamic about our trust? Do you know about your index cases? How many numbers you've done? You got, I got asked, you will get asked. How many aneurysms can you do? How many lap right hemis have you done? How many you know, oncoplastic resections have you done? I pro There's a brilliant website, which is medicalinterviews.co.uk, <coughs> which has consultant interview questions on. Links to clinical governance stuff, a summary of all the NHS policies and papers. I prepared over 
I preferred answers to over a hundred different questions which are on that website just so I had a, something to go in there with. And at the top I didn't say that little list at the top or those four letters were my default answer. That was my structure for anything. C being clinical, R being research, M being management, T being teaching. And if they asked me a question and I wasn't entirely clear, I would always use that structure to try and respond to it. So that was my default answer uh, to anything I was unsure about, using a structure. Again, courses we discussed. There is a cost in, implied. I didn't go on one. I'm going to run through these. Um, <clears throat> these are all questions that I was going to show you just off the website and stuff that I've prepared. But they are actually on that website anyway. In the interview, who's there? I had a chair, the non-executive trust chairman, the director of development and personnel, medical and divisional director, clinical director, a consultant colleague, a consultant from an affi affiliated speciality, which is a consultant vascular radiologist, a college, rep a college representative, and someone from human resources. Uh, and just quickly, I'll stick them all up, uh, and you can have a read. Interesting things. I had to explain to the clinical director as if he was a 65-year-old gentleman who's just had an aneurysm picked up on screening what that was. So it was a role-play moulage thing in the middle of the, in the interview. And then I had to consent him for a repair. So this was some sort of like role-play that then just started in the middle of the interview. And obviously the radiologist had some question on why would surgeons do their job, um, which you have to give a political in, uh, response to. Um, <coughs> that's that. Again, more questions, uh, which uh, you can uh, have a quick read of. And finally, you all you saw some pictures before about how you should rev how you should celebrate after you uh, pass your exams. So some warnings about. Um, how should you should celebrate after you part, after you get your job? This is where I was this morning. So, just be careful. <laughs> okay, uh, listen. Obviously, we've got to go. If there's any, I mean, I know most of you. If you don't, give us a ring, send me an email. I'll be more than happy to help with all of this. This is obviously going on to the YouTube site, which you can access through the Facebook School of Surgery site. So you can get it through there. But anyone, I'll be more than happy. If I can be of any help to anyone, just give us a buzz, send us an email, whatever. Okay, cheers, guys. And can you please?